get specific <clears throat> to my labs, I mm. noticed my glucose, it, I was fasted, I believe 18 hours. My glucose fasted was 95 mm. milligrams per deciliter is what we're using. Mm. And I mean, I haven't had a carbohydrate in ages. Yeah. So then I'm trying to figure out, well, would my body, in the same line of thinking as making cholesterol, well, would my body make too much through gluconeogenesis to actually not poison my blood, but create a secondary problem? And then I start going, well, what if I'm stressed out because I'm about to give blood and I don't like needles? And so I get stuck sometimes in these loops and and allopathic seems to just come in there and just give you such a simple but wrong answer, in my opinion. Yeah. And I it's just not a complex, robust answer. Mm. So so yeah. So for somebody who has an eight a carbohydrate, who has that much glucose, should I be concerned? No. Or is that just my no. body? Okay, my there brain? is there is no evidence anywhere in the medical literature that would suggest to any reasonable practitioner that having a fasting blood glucose at around 95 is problematic. If you are consuming a species-appropriate, species-specific diet consisting of the flesh and fat of large ruminant animals, mostly. The thing is that it's not the average or the fasting blood glucose that does the damage so much. It's the spiking Mm. that does the damage. So when you eat, it happens. only happens if you eat carbohydrates. So if you eat- Even the most robust, ex- let's, so, and that's where I never get good information in the textbooks and the medical books I'm looking at. So let's say I'm under massive stress mm. or I'm, I'm in the gym really getting to it. I'm, I'm fully anaerobic. That doesn't compare to eating glucose in terms of its, or carbohydrate turning to glucose in terms of that pathological number. Or can that get that high? The the fasting blood glucose does tend to drift up over time in people who report eating a fully carnivorous diet. I think there is a homeostatic optimal set point. You do need a certain amount of glucose in your blood at all times. Your body is capable of putting it there and it does that by gluconeogenesis. The point that I was making is with the spiking being the problem, not the average value being the problem. A person who has poor blood glucose control has both highs and lows. When you average out those huge highs and massive lows, you will get to a number that says this is healthy, that's slightly less healthy, and once we get to this number, well, now that's pathological. And it's around about the 100 that they start going, oh, there's a real problem. And here are you, a carnival coming along with the fasting blood glucose of 95, saying I'm as healthy as a jackrabbit, whatever. And they're saying, no, look at your look at your blood glucose. It's drifting up over time. You've got insulin resistance. That's what it is because you're eating so much fat. It's lipotoxicity. That's what it is. Not to mention all that heart disease and stuff that you're going to get. That's their argument. However, it's not the 95 that's a problem. It's the 200 plus on the spike. That was the problem for the, the person the, who has the, the poor control. The 40 but, that goes up to the 200. Right? right. But because they also have such low levels, their average right. will sit around the 100. But actually, it was the 200 that was the problem, not the closer to 50 or whatever. So, like, if, if your blood glucose is stable, pretty much irrespective of eating, sleeping, the morning effect, all of that, you should be in quite a small range all the time. If you are, that is effective blood glucose control. Now, I'm not suggesting now, you should you be doing that at 150. It? That's not what I'm saying. But yeah. I'm saying there's no evidence that 100 is a problem. Well, the only way to know that would be testing your glucose throughout the day then, correct? Yeah. If, and, if I'm really trying to find that. Yes. And if you want to make conclusions about what's good for the population, then you need to get a whole bunch of people and track their blood glucose continuously for a fair period of time as well under control of making sure that you have them in a lab and you know exactly what they really were eating. Good luck. Which we know how that goes. Exactly. We know how reporting goes. Yeah. Okay. And then is that, in your opinion, is that the main uh, offender of what will lead to arthrosclerosis or the problems we're talking about? That, that gly- that's glyco glycation. Yeah. Is that spike that's... Okay. So if, if you're looking for the ingredients for heart disease, okay, well, here we go. They are physical damage, injury to the epithelial cells. No injury, no problem, no atherosclerosis, irrespective of the level of LDL or anything else. So you need that damage. You need an inflammatory immune response to that physical damage. 
Furthermore, you need that immune response to become chronic and embedded in the system, and you do that with things like glycolytic damage and oxidative damage to various okay. lipids, proteins, whatever else. Now you've got a situation where you've got an atherosclerosis developing. Those are the ingredients. Gotcha. And what other things are... So I guess, is the damage detectable or you only know the damage is there because at some point, you know, you, you get in there and you see the arthroscopic right. sclerotic activity? Yeah. Or how, how would one know, like let's say, you know, I'm near 50 years old, how would I know if I'm, I mean, you, you mentioned high blood pressure earlier. That could be an indicator that I'm doing some damage, correct? Yeah. Or eating carbohydrates could be an indicator that I'm doing some damage. Yeah. yeah. There are several ways of assessing your current and ongoing heart disease situation. One of them, not necessarily the best idea, and you would only do it perhaps a couple of times over a number of years separation to test that what you're doing is heading you in the right direction, I guess. I'm talking the calcium, the arterial calcium scan, coronary artery calcium scan. It's called CAC scan, where you go and they take a lot of slices through images wise. They take a lot of slices through the heart and they look at the coronary arteries and they see how much calcium is deposited in the walls of those calcium arteries. And that shows us how, what to what level you have advanced process of heart disease developing there. And the CAC score ranges from zero to over a thousand people can get. And they say that over a certain number is, is fairly problematic, most likely. That's, an, that's a clear assessment of the actual disease process extant in a, in a given person's body at the time. The reason I say you wouldn't do it too often is because the dose of RADs you're going to get for that test is quite significant. So you need to think that's about nice. that too. It's much more yeah. than getting an x-ray, much more. The other ways around it is that often they're using ultrasound techniques to try and see soft plaques before they develop into hardened ones with calcium to get some sort of a gauge on that. And then of course the one the people that disparage the CAC test as the as the gold standard diagnostic test will say yes, but they only pick up advanced plaques with calcium. They don't that doesn't pick up the soft tissue. So you might get a combination. You might get a CAC scan and a soft tissue scan and then leave it probably five years doing the right thing by your body inflammation wise which I've got videos on my channel, by the way, if people want to go and have a look at those. There's one called Four Health Hacks, where I'm doing that. And I'm probably wearing this top because I do quite often when I'm doing videos. Um, who knows? Yeah, it's become a bit of an icon, this thing, but that's, and that's for another day. So they're the diagnostic tests that will get at the actual disease process in a given area that you're looking at, because you can't look at the whole vascular tree, can you? throughout the whole body. Right. Luckily, atherosclerotic plaques are localized to predictable areas, and it's the very largest of the vessels at and around the bifurcations or around curves, because the other one, you've got a curve of blood going like the aortic arch. The blood that goes around the top of the arch has a much more rapid passage past any given epithelial cell, and as such, doesn't have time to exert that pressure to force crap in between loose gap junctions, whereas the blood that's going through underneath on the underside is whirling around and eddying and being much slower, and it's really forcing that situation. That's where you find the atherosclerotic plaques on the underside, for mm -hmm. example. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, once again, a correlation between eating hydrate or having elevated blood glucose and blood pressure. Yeah, It's not a, a direct, but that is a, a, is that a causation or more of just a correlation. To my way of thinking, in my understanding as a cardiovascular physiologist, among other things, it is absolutely just about certain that a significant bolus of carbohydrate will lead to a very significant period of inflammation. And if you pile up boluses and boluses and boluses of carbohydrates, one after the other, meal after meal, day after day, week after week, then you're chronically inflamed. And chronic inflammation will create more pressure on the high pressure system. Feel that well. Exactly, because the and inflammatory how, the inflammatory response loosens those gap junctions, among other things. Right, right. 
And is there a difference in a, a carbohydrate spike that's just straight to glucose in the blood versus a fructose or ethyl alcohol spike that has to go through the liver? Yeah, there are slight differences. Absolutely. Um, that's a level of abstraction that becomes more relevant when you've got guys like Saladino running around saying eating fruit's great for you and you should do a lot of that. No, Paul. False. Bad idea. Again, for another day. I've covered that on my channel as well. If people want to go and see yeah, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why I asked to see if mm -hmm. that, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Because I, I, I get that. Eat your fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Please, please don't. Okay. The other thing that's really interesting that people don't talk about, and I don't know why, is that people talk about fatty streaks. They talk about fatty plaques. They talk about cholesterol-rich plaques in the... In the um, in the arteries, they talk about cholesterol gumming up your arteries. Okay. The amount of cholesterol that you find in a typical atherosclerotic lesion is less than one tenth of one percent of the lesion. What do you mean cholesterol rich plaque? What do you mean fatty plaque? It's scar tissue. It's 95% scar tissue. There's a very, very more small amount of fibrotic tissue. Yeah. And mineral-based tissue. Yeah. It's scar tissue that then later actually ossifies, becomes calcified, hence that's when the calcium artery scan will show that up. Interesting, it's isn't just, it? Just, yeah. So yeah, there's basically no cholesterol there. And the fact that well, there's scar tissue there... to support there, that hypothesis. Somehow. Yeah, the, the fact that there's scar tissue there doesn't mean that that scar tissue was caused by the fact that there's cholesterol there. It's that cause and effect thing again, for which there's, there's right. nothing out there that will say it is cause and effect.